God, we pray that what we have just sung would be true of our hearts and that we would long more than anything to fix our eyes on you. And even now as we open up your word and look at your word together, I pray that we would have soft, humble hearts, eager to be molded and transformed. Lord, this morning we would hear what we must from your word, that we might be pleasing to you and know you better, love you deeper. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. You can open up your Bible to the book of James. James chapter 2 is where we are going to be this morning. This morning we're going to be looking at what God has to say about partiality. What God has to say about partiality or favoritism, particularly within the body of Christ. Uh, James is providing invaluable information to the early Jewish Christians in regards to how one who has been reconciled to God through faith in Christ ought to conduct themselves. And out of the gates, he gives them great comfort and specific instruction pertaining to what they were undoubtedly facing, which is trials. And we saw that a couple weeks ago in chapter 1. Last week, we saw James transition into the disposition that they should have before God's word. And this morning, we're going to see specific instruction for the church pertaining to personal favoritism. Personal favoritism or partiality. And at first glance, this may seem inconsistent with what James has been talking about. Yet in reality, a key expression of genuine faith is indiscriminate love for one another unselfish love for others, and that's what we have received from God in Christ, and that must be a staple for us as his church. Favoritism for personal gain is not a learned behavior. It's something that is rooted in selfishness and comes out at the earliest ages. You all remember those friends who didn't really want to be your friend until they found out about something you had that was cool. Or maybe you were the one looking for those who had the cool things so that you could befriend them. I I know of someone who prior to being a believer actually dated a girl because of her pet. No, no, wait. She had a flying squirrel. A flying squirrel. He didn't have a sincere interest in her, but going over to her place and tossing her squirrel across the apartment to watch it fly was too much fun to pass up. We all have a tendency to view relationships with a what can you do for me mentality. Well, what can I get out of this relationship? That's the one I'll invest myself in. Favoritism is a very real temptation for each of us because each of us has sinful ambition and self-love. A tendency to look at others as something to be taken advantage of for our advancement or our desires as opposed to someone to pour ourselves out for in love. This personal ambition, this, this favoritism views people sinfully, seeing them as aids to the advancement of our agendas or self-promotion. And as ones who have been reconciled through indiscriminate love from God, there is to be no place for this in the body of Christ. Let's look together at what James says about favoritism or partiality. Look at James chapter 2, starting in verse 1. We'll make our way through verse 13 this morning. James says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen. 
My beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in the faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Clearly, this was an issue in the early church. Avoiding partiality is imperative to the Christian life, and it seems to be something that was happening frequently early on. Being impartial must be a a character trait of us all. In fact, the characteristic originates from what God himself is like. He is the standard and the, the perfect example of one who is impartial, and we are called to imitate him in this. Every Christian should be impartial in how he or she holds their faith. We naturally discriminate. We're naturally inclined to be partial. We tend to put people in pigeonholes, in predetermined categories. We rank people in our hearts based on their looks and their clothes and their race, their ethnicity, their social status, their personality, their intelligence, their wealth, their power, their houses, their cars, their possessions. When left to ourselves, that's what we are inclined to do. But that is not how God views people at all. In fact, Deuteronomy 10, 17, Moses says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality or take bribes. God is not swayed by human influence. And God's expectation is that his people reflect that same kind of impartiality within the household of God. Thus, we see true faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism. In light of who God is and what he demands of us, true faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism. One who possesses true faith in Jesus as their savior cannot maintain an attitude of favoritism within his household. Where faith in Jesus exists, partiality cannot, it must not. And what we're going to look at this morning is six reasons why true faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism or partiality. So, true faith in Jesus cannot exist, coexist with favoritism first because, number one, favoritism is forbidden in the life of the believer. Favoritism is forbidden in the life of the believer. Look again at verse 1. It's right there. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. We see this in a simple command. And James, again, addresses his readers with a tender affection as he says, My brethren, he continues speaking hard truths, direct truths with great implications on their lives in a tender way. He sets forth the most clear and and, and basic principle for them. If you have genuine faith in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot hold that faith with partiality or favoritism. An emphatic command. Favoritism is to have no place within the body of Christ. As followers of Jesus, who is so glorious, we must not make such improper distinctions among ourselves. 
or among those who might enter into our presence, into our assembly. What is favoritism? Well, it's this. It's to judge others based on their appearance, and on the basis of that, give special attention or favor or respect or consideration to certain individuals, and then not to others. This is where we judge purely on superficial things. We make distinctions in our heart. We have an attitude within us of valuing external superficial things, and this attitude flows inevitably into how we treat those individuals. This is a what I think you can do for me kind of attitude that impacts what I do for you. When James says an attitude of personal favoritism, he actually uses one word in the original, and it has the literal meaning of lifting up someone's face, lifting up someone's face with the idea of judging by appearance, and on that basis, giving special favor and respect. It is to judge simply on worldly things, particularly with an attitude of selfishness. God God desires his people to love with a love that seeks nothing in return. God desires his people to no longer be tied to this world in a way that influences how we would treat another. To no longer be tied to this world in a way that we would use people for personal worldly advancement or for the esteem of men. And if this is all that God said about favoritism, it would be enough. If God pulled the because I said so card, it would be worthy of submitting to and obeying. Yet he gives us more. So we see, first of all, true faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism because favoritism favoritism is, is forbidden by God. God instructs us not to do so. And next, number two, we see that true faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism because favoritism is demonstrated as an evil from the heart. Favoritism is demonstrated as an evil from the heart. James gives a scenario, a hypothetical that probably hit very close to home for his early readers. He gives an example of what favoritism would look like for these early Christians. Look again at verse 2. James says, For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing fine clothes and say, You sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit down by my footstool. That's the scenario that he gives. That's the demonstration of favoritism at work. And as we consider this demonstration, it's important to understand that the majority of early converts to Christianity were Jewish and were predominantly poor. In fact, either they were already poor or they suddenly became poor when they turned to follow Christ. The cost was high to follow Jesus. Many were thrown out of their homes or lost their work because of turning to Jesus, and yet their society was much like ours where preference and favoritism were shown toward those who had specific status or look or prestige or whatever. Not all were poor, but many were, and so James's illustration shows the contrast be how, be, be, uh, in regards to how the poor and the rich were being treated. In James' example, the two are contrasted visitors from outside. One is rich, he's esteemed, ostentatious. The eye catches the expensive ring on his finger and is captivated by his fancy clothing. This one comes into the assembly of believers, seemingly to to see what their worship is like. There also is a, a poor man in dirty, shabby clothes, and the eye at once notices this man's poverty. There is a quickness to notice the external. And this man likewise seems to have heard something about these Christians and wants to see what their worship is like and comes into their assembly. Two very different people outwardly walk into the assembly and the Christians show special attention to one, the one wearing fine clothes. And they give to this one a seat of honor, kind treatment, 
special preference. And then the poor man is to go stand over there, be wedged in at the rear, or sit, at, sit on the floor close to a person's footstool. It's a tragic scene. Uh, no one would think of treating a rich person in such a way, and apparently no one was thinking of treating this poor man as they would a rich It's clear that a distinction has been made and with all of the wrong reasons and all of the wrong motives. The conclusion of the hypothetical illustration is that by showing special favor to the well-dressed man and showing discourtesy or unkindness to the poor man, sin has been committed. Look at verse 4. In response to this hypothetical situation, He says, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Favoritism is demonstrated in this illustration and what comes to the top as this illustration takes place is that this favoritism reveals an evil of the heart. Those who act in such a way are guilty of favoritism. They have become judges with evil motives. And favoritism is an evil that comes from our hearts. And making these distinctions, they have acted upon a verdict that they made. They have become judges. Making conclusions that reveal evil. And partiality is an evil that puts on display the internal reality of the one practicing it. Partiality is an outward demonstration of an inward evil. Among the body of Christ, this kind of behavior and discrimination is much more than just poor hospitality or ignorant negligence. It's evil. We must call it what God calls it. What we actually find is of the three words that James uses for evil, the one used here is actually the strongest. It carries the idea of vicious intentions that have destructive effects. When we show favoritism, it brings a destructive effect upon the body of Christ. It brings a reproach upon Christ himself. That we who have been saved by his grace would make such distinctions. The, the point here, what James is getting at is, is the soul of one worth more than another? Are the rich more valuable to God? Race or culture, age, position, fame, background, none of these things are impressive to God. That some would be more deserving of the gospel than others? to be shown greater favor within the household of God for others because of such spiritualist things, such worldly influences, influencing our thinking should never be the case. External worldly qualifiers should never influence how we extend love towards others. No, we should be so bursting with the love of Christ which was freely lavished upon us when we did not deserve it, that we shower anyone and everyone who were to possibly come into our assembly with self-giving love and care and honor. We recognize individuals as souls and we pour ourselves out in love for every individual fleeing the prospect of of evil flowing from our hearts through partiality. Rich, poor, young, old, it doesn't matter what ethnicity, what culture, what social status, we, we throw ourselves at every relationship in selfless love and care. Because that's what God is like. That's what he's done for you if you're a believer in Jesus. 
And that's actually where James goes next. True faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism because favoritism is forbidden in the life of the believer. Favoritism is demonstrated as an evil from the heart. And next, true faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism because number three, favoritism is inconsistent with the character of God. Favoritism is inconsistent with the character of God. Look at verse five. James says, listen, my beloved brethren... Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? James's next appeal is to the character of God, how God has chosen to love others, how God has chosen to show love to the poor of the world. Here, James sets forth the argument that God chose the poor of this world to be rich in the faith. And look at the beginning of verse 5. He says, listen, my beloved brethren, James is again giving instruction with tenderness and care. This is a hard truth. They're working to figure things out. And in love, James is presenting this principle of self-giving love. And as James presents this tender, loving instruction, he wants his readers to understand that to be partial is inconsistent with God's character. God has not been partial in salvation. And so James points to the very work of God in salvation. Has God allowed anyone's social status to influence him? The obvious answer is no, of course not. Of course not. God chose the poor of this world to be rich in the faith. And so those with genuine faith in God who have experienced the generous love of God must not treat anyone as less important than another. And I want to point out that James does not say that God only chose the poor of this world or that he didn't choose any rich, but rather he's making it clear that God does not show partiality. God did not only choose rich, but he actually has chosen the poor of the world to be rich in the faith. In this time, the rich got richer, the poor got poorer. We see that. And yet God didn't demonstrate his self-giving love based off of the external riches and wealth and social status of people on this earth. Actually, the poor get infinite riches in Christ, and the rich realize that their richness is actually nothing compared to the riches found in Christ. Whether you're rich or poor, in this world, there's one solution to your sin problem, and it's the gospel. It's Jesus. God possesses this treasure far beyond any material wealth, and he offers that to everyone without discrimination. God is concerned with true riches, and true riches are only found in him. God's not impressed by our saving accounts by our investments, by our, our business ventures, by our houses or cars. He's not impressed by any of those things. In the same way, he's not deterred by your poverty. He doesn't overlook extending the riches that are found in him of grace and mercy because your accounts are empty. He's not swayed by your past. There's no sin you've committed. There's no sin committed against you that God would then restrict his love towards you because of. How sweet is that? Isn't that precious? No upbringing that would keep us from God's saving grace. God offers this precious gift in the gospel of himself for everyone who would repent and believe. And listen, we who believe in a Savior so majestic, so awesome, so powerful, so righteous, so holy, so infinitely glorious, must see the complete vanity of all earthly treasures, of all earthly glory, and we must rise above being impressed by such vain things, by such selfish ambition. 
We cannot be impressed by the things that the world is perpetually impressed by. God had nothing to gain from me that led him to sacrifice his son for me, and yet he did so out of love. And we too are called to give of ourselves lovingly without expectation of anything in return from one another. We love with a love that is not our own. We love with the love of Christ. To do anything else would be inconsistent with the character of God and therefore is not fitting for his children. Number four, true faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism because favoritism is irrational for the believer. It's irrational for the believer. James moves to a, an argument of logic. Look at verses six and seven. This is really in, interesting. He says, but you have dishonored the poor man. This is just irrational in context of what's taking place here. Continue reading in verse 6. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? Your heart is being poured, pulled to a sinful partiality towards those who are actually your greatest means of persecution and struggle. It's simply illogical. All of the other reasons are absolutely true, but if you set those aside and just simply look to the logic of the fact, it doesn't make any sense that you would esteem these people who are persecuting and speaking falsely, they're blaspheme, blaspheming the name of Christ. James contrasts God's character now with their own. You've dishonored the poor man. God saves the poor. He, he gives unmerited kindness and favor to the poor, giving them riches in himself, and yet you've dishonored the poor man, totally unlike God. How, he asks, in effect, can you claim to be God's child and yet think and act so differently from him? It's inconsistent. It doesn't make sense. You treat those, uh, the kind of people whom God has chosen to save and has lavished heavenly riches upon worse than the rich man who actually is the one who is the primary source of earthly struggles. On this side of things, it's easy to see the irrational nature of how they're acting, and yet, how quickly can we do the very same? I mean, just partiality aside, the, the logical nature, the illogical nature of giving ourselves over to any sin in light of Jesus paying for that sin with his very blood is tragic and heartbreaking. James goes on to point out how irrational it is to show preference to the rich by reminding his readers that it's the rich who exercise their power over them and oppress them. And even worse, they're blaspheming the name of God. Now, James is most likely speaking of the rich Jews, many of whom were Sadducees. These men were oppressors. They were ungodly men, for the most part, who took advantage of and oppressed the poorer Jews. They made a common practice of especially taking advantage of and harassing Christian Jews. The Roman government allowed the Jews a great deal of legal control over their own nationals, and we see this when Saul sought to arrest and perse persecute Christian Jews prior to his conversion. And the rich and the powerful Jews, they were able to then mistreat and take advantage of the poor by dragging them before their synagogue, their courts, or their judgment seats. And these noble, rich Jews were notorious for mistreatment of the Jewish Christians and yet were being given honorable treatment within the assembly. Even rather than this, they were apparently also known for the fact that they would blaspheme Jesus. They're taking advantage of Christians as if that weren't bad enough, the, the persecution taking place. They're also mocking the name of God. They're mocking the name of God. 
the readers of James' letter certainly have no reasonable reason for such special treatment of the rich over the poor. It's irrational. And yet James' point in this, it's important to remember, his argument is meant to poke holes in the thinking of his readers and the irrational nature of their behavior. James is not saying, don't show kindness to the rich. He's not saying, look at how they're mistreating you, so don't show honor to the rich, only show honor to the poor. The the command is to not be partial. And so his argument here about the irrational nature of what they're doing is not instructive to tell them to treat the poor harshly, or the rich harshly and teach, teach, ah, treat the rich harshly (laughs) and treat the poor poorly. (laughs) Well, that's not what he's saying. No, he's saying don't show partiality within the household of Christ. I got a new tongue twister to work on. (laughs) Try to get it down. The command remains, don't hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with favoritism. Show love, show kindness, show care with no expectation of how people must receive and respond to that consideration. Number five, true faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism because number five, favoritism is a condemnable offense toward God. Favoritism is a condemnable offense toward God. When we show favoritism, when we show partiality, like with any sin, we are primarily sinning against God. And here we see clearly that favoritism is a transgression or an infraction, a violation of God's divine law. Look at verses 8 through 11. James says, verse 8, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself... You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Favoritism is a condemnable offense toward God. And James starts this by pointing out the royal law that we are, all call, we are all called to. What is the royal law that James is referring to? Well, James tells us, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. James here is referencing Jesus' words in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, where Jesus is being tested by a lawyer and is asked, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus responds with, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then second, and then says the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Because favoritism is rooted in self-love, when demonstrating favoritism, you are failing to fulfill Jesus' instruction to love others. You're breaking the royal law. This royal law is royal because it is of such a quality that on it hangs all of the law. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And James draws attention to the significance and and what is at stake with partiality, where you are impartial and showing love to all. You are, James says, at the end of verse 8, doing well. But verse 9, if you show partiality, you're sinning, you're violating God's standard and are failing to fulfill Jesus' command to love others as yourself. The royal law forbids that you would treat one man in one way and another in the opposite. In fact, partiality is is a revealer of self-love, not selfless love. You show partiality out of fear of man or love of things, love of self. Yet we are to love with God's love. 
Uh, Partiality is not merely a matter of being inconsiderate, preoccupied, discouragement, uh, discourteous, disengaged, thoughtless. No, it's it's a serious sin before the Lord. It is a sin that misses the mark of God's standard of righteousness, and James then demonstrates that. He says, listen, in order to become a lawbreaker and a sinner, it's only necessary to disobey a single commandment. This is not a lesser sin. It is condemnable in and of itself. Verse 10, look again. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. James shares a very generous scenario that someone would actually keep the whole law and stumble at just one point, that scenario has never happened. We all know that we're guilty of far more than just one infraction against God's law. But if that were the case, if that happened, if we just stumbled one moment of personal favoritism for somebody out of self-love, we're condemnable before the Lord. One moment of favoritism, one display of partiality is worthy of the judgment of God. That's right that it is. That's not unjust of God. That's not, man, what an extreme dictator. That's evidence of of God's holiness, his majesty, his righteousness, and our sinfulness that we would oppose someone like him. And it also is a testimony to his immeasurable grace that just one infraction would be condemnable for all eternity, and yet he rescues and saves anyone should just be astonishing to our hearts. The standard is keeping God's whole law, uh, not just part of it. The murderer in his own defense does not appeal to his lack of thievery. The person who runs a red light doesn't appeal to the judge in respect to all of the red lights that they stopped at before that one that they ran. No. If we fail, as we all do, we are thus guilty of the law. It's like a piece of glass being shattered, breaking even one commandment is condemnable. Favoritism, partiality, selfish love, just one time is a condemnable offense against a holy God. That should sober us. That should sober us. James quotes then from Exodus 20, As an example, he's not saying we're under Mosaic law still. That's not why he does this. But rather, he chooses two of the seemingly most serious social sins. And in both cases, the penalty in the Old Testament is death. It seems as though he chose these examples to demonstrate the seriousness of the sin of partiality. And to demonstrate simply in the example that any breaking of God's instruction makes you a breaker of God's law. Partiality, favoritism, is a sin against a holy God. And God's command for us, for you, believer, is that we would be impartial, extending self-giving love towards all with no discrimination. And this is a wonderful command. This is a kindness of the Lord to us that would guard us against self-love and self-advancement and help point us to seeking above all the glory of Christ and the good of his people. When we love this way, when we are loving others impartially, we are loving with a heavenly love. We, as James says in verse 8, we're doing well. Uh, That's a light way to say what is being communicated there. We We are being exceptional. We are doing excellently. It is very good that we would love this way. Lastly, True faith in Jesus cannot coexist with favoritism because favoritism is a testimony to false faith. 
Favoritism is a testimony to false faith. Look at verses 12 and 13. James doesn't pull any punches here. He's speaking truthfully. He's speaking boldly about the significance of such a sin among the people of God. He says in verse 12, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Because favoritism is such a serious sin, James closes this section with a call, with an appeal for believers to consider the imminence of divine judgment. Look at verse 12. He says, speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. What is the law of liberty? It could be read, the law that produces freedom. Ones who are judged by this law receive a merciful salvation. The law that produces freedom. This is the gospel. This is the implanted word. Which is able to save our souls, as he referenced in chapter 1. James is warning us to not let our faith become compromised or destroyed by favoritism. In fact, to show favoritism is out of character for the believer. Each believer will stand before God in judgment, not under condemnation, but for reward, giving an account for their actions in light of receiving God's grace and the freedom from sin that follows. Romans 8.1 stands true. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, but there is a giving of an account that each of us will do as we have a stewardship in this gospel, in the grace of God to live for his glory. And we'll give an account of that and there are rewards to follow for those who live well in light of that. And so speak and, and act as those who have been freed from sin and given everything you need to be pleasing to the Lord. You have what you need if you're a Christian to show indiscriminate love. And so live and act as one who will be judged as such. Live consistently with the salvation that you have received in Christ and love with a Christ-like love. In light of this, speak and act. Live your faith and your life, the entirety of who you are as one who embraces the word of God truly, living by faith in the gospel and live in, and act as one who is no longer under the condemnation of your own sins. Your condemnation has been lifted. Your sins have been forgiven. They are separated from you. Upon the cross of Christ, he bore that sin and he took the punishment and the wrath that each one of us deserved in our sin. He endured the wrath that we endured so that we could live like one who is not under that wrath, but has been liberated from sin's bondage. That liberating law says, forgiven, reconciled, justified, loved, accepted, equipped, able to live for the glory of Christ. And so live consistently with that. Live consistently with that. This is the same as saying, live and act as a true believer. Yet if you do not show mercy, if you show no mercy, if you pass judgment on others, and remember, this is a, this is a judgment of to what degree you are willing to expend, extend love towards others. This is a judgment that leads to partiality. This is a judgment of one's external position and appearance that then impacts to what degree you're willing to love and serve. This is judgment leading to partiality. If you do this, your judgment that you receive will be merciless. If you show partiality and continue on without repenting, you need to take some spiritual inventory. In fact, one who habitually shows partiality is demonstrating themselves to have a false faith. That's how inconsistent 
the sin of partiality is with who the Christian is called to be. Those who show no mercy, their lives are characterized by partiality, hardness, selfishness, lack of concern for others. They will not receive mercy. James says judgment will be merciless for those who show no mercy yet. Oh, there's hope. Yet. What a precious contrast we see here. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Favoritism testifies of a false faith. Yet for those who show Christ-like love and extend mercy to everyone, they do not need to fear judgment. They give outward demonstration of the inward reality that has taken root in their life. Mercy triumphs over judgment because mercy testifies to genuine saving faith. Favoritism is a testimony to false faith. This should, this should sober us, stop us in our tracks. What James is not saying is that in a moment of weakness, if you shall show favoritism to anyone, that's it, you've lost your salvation. That's not what he's saying. Uh, this, is a, this is a struggle. We love ourselves more than we ought. And favoritism comes from a heart of self-love. It's an evil that flows from a heart of self-love. There is forgiveness. We need to recognize this sin where it exists in our lives and repent of that. And there's great hope in the gospel. But if this is a staple of your life and you're unwilling to change, that reveals something about you. So, what does this all mean for Grace Bible Church? I've had the privilege of being a part of this church since its inception. And I have, for 17 years or however long we've been around, experienced unparalleled love and care and encouragement and consideration from you in such sweet ways that testify, speak so loudly to the love that you clearly have received from Christ and that love of Christ that you clearly demonstrate to me as well as to each other. In one regard, looking at this passage should be a cause for rejoicing at God's grace in our lives. I've never observed someone treating one person well because they were rich and another poorly because they were poor. I'm sure we're capable of it. I haven't witnessed that personally. However, in light of this passage, it would be appropriate for each of us to consider what is driving our relationships. Just because we have had victory in the past doesn't guarantee that next week somebody might walk into our assembly and we sin against the Lord by showing partiality. We must guard ourselves from this kind of self-love. We should consider where, where are we placing contingencies in our love for one another? Maybe it's not a, a rich and a poor person. Maybe there's something else that we're looking at and we'll extend ourselves in self-giving love for someone if they meet these expectations and requirements that we built up in our heart or our mind, but we won't if they fail to meet those expectations. Maybe something else to consider. Do you justify your lack of participation in the body of Christ? Do you, do you justify your, your lack of engagement in faithfulness to Scripture's one another commands because of unmet expectations. See, the, the sin of partiality shows a, a view for the external that drives the internal. And for the believer, we actually should recognize what Christ has done internally in his gospel that drives us to live faithfully externally. What do I mean by that? We need to be faithful to love because Christ was faithful to love us. We don't pursue love towards others because those around me are meeting my expectations. Uh, 
Have you ever had a thought of, you know, I'm just, just not going to go to small group, just not getting a lot out of it? What does that reveal about how you're thinking about your participation? Or Sunday mornings, or build, or wellspring, or just a get together among believers? Are you quick to show mercy to others? Are you one who is in constant complaint about others? Or are you merciful? Do you have an eye that notices all of the offenses and wrongs and inadequacies of those around you? Or are you quick and, and active in extending the same mercy towards each other that you have received in Christ? Do you, do you extend love indiscriminately? These are helpful things to consider for personal evaluation, to seek to love consistently with how Christ has loved us. And these are good things to consider and, and ponder. There's probably another category of people that I want to speak to for a moment. Do you ever feel like partiality is shown to others um, favorably? Maybe even as you've listened this morning, you've thought, I'm the poor one. I'm the neglected one. I'm the one getting the short end of the stick. No one really cares about me. If I was gone, nobody would notice. No one spends time with me. No one invests themselves in me. Listen, many, if not all of us, at some point in time have felt that way. It, I've, I've had to speak truth to, my, to myself. I am loved so well, and there's times where I feel lonely. Everybody has somebody to be with and is doing stuff. I'm hearing about people getting together. Wow, body life sounds really fun. I wish I could be a part of it. We can feel this way very easily if left to our own thoughts. And I would just encourage you, do, do not let discontentment grow in your heart. If that's you this morning, if you feel like an outsider within our own church, this is my church, I've been here for years, and I feel like an outsider. If that's you, would you please come talk to me or any one of the elders? We desire earnestly for every person to be loved well and everyone to feel that love within the body of Christ. And if, if you're feeling neglected in this body, we want to know and we want to help desperately. Sometimes we just don't know. And then remember, wherever God has you this morning in your feelings, it, it is better to give than to receive. It, it is... It is the call of each Christian to be what God calls them to be, regardless of how you're feeling others are treating you in that moment. So if you have unmet expectations, don't respond by not meeting God's expectations of you. Be what God calls you to be. But also, please come speak with someone, because we would love to help you. We would love to care for you. We would love to help you be more plugged in, more encouraged in whatever way we can. Lastly, in, in all of this instruction regarding partiality and the importance of putting off partiality and favoritism, we, we must, in all of this, we, we have to, this morning, first and foremost, above anything else, what we, what we cannot miss this morning is the great mercy of God that he would show love with no partiality. There is nothing attractive about me before a holy God. There's nothing in us that would merit such kindness and mercy. We must be impressed by God's grace, by his indiscriminate love, by the gospel that would rescue us. As Romans 5 says, when we were helpless, godless sinners. 
Do you know this gospel? Have you placed your faith in Jesus? Do you know this mercy? You must. And we must remember this great mercy of our Savior. This is what drives everything. We're we're not called to be impartial simply for impartiality's sake. We are sinners saved by grace, reconciled through mercy, with new life in God. And we must seek to respond as ones who have been saved by such grace and love as we love each other. Grace Bible Church, thank you for loving so well. Let's, let's do even better. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word which cuts to the heart. Lord, I know in my own heart things were laid bare, conditions and contingencies in my own heart that drive service and love of others were revealed. And Lord, where that exists in my dear friends here this morning, I pray that we would see those things and that we would repent of those things and that we would show indiscriminate love, that there would be no impart or no partiality, no favoritism within within this church. And Lord, that we would think rightly and understand and see clearly your great mercy that has covered our sins, that has saved us, that has rescued us. And in turn, we would love each other well. We ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.